I'm generally always drawn to issues that focus on women and marginalized communities. Um, in my 16 films, I think more than uh, a, a dozen of them have been about women okay. uh, around the world. And I think that as a woman, I feel more empathy towards those issues and I'm able to highlight those issues because women have a certain bond and they allow me into their homes and into their lives that they normally wouldn't allow other people into. I've always said that my being a woman has been my biggest asset uh, working in the kind of environments that I worked in. If I was a man, I'd probably not be alive right now uh, because uh, the kind of places that I've been and the kind of people I speak to, being a woman is very helpful because they don't perceive me as a threat. I know it can work both ways because sometimes they don't take you seriously because you're a woman, but you need to use that to your advantage. For example, um, the very fact that the first time I interviewed the Taliban, they didn't take me seriously. That's why they divulged so much information to me that when the film came out, they themselves were shocked that they had done that. But so you have to use certain situations to your advantage. Um, and actually, I have to say that being a female fil filmmaker is very empowering because the women allow you into the inner sanctum when you're filming them, and the men don't perceive you as a threat. So it's like confession. They tell you things they shouldn't. And um, it works really well for me. For, uh, let me give you an example. Um, in the Philippines, I did a film about illegal abortion. And because of the film, uh, in Manila, the government was forced to rethink its policy about not handing out contraceptives in public clinics. The film was used by an organization there and by a doctor, Junis Melgar, to push for that. Um, in South Africa, I did a film about illegal immigration um, and about uh, xenophobia. Uh, when the film came out, um, there, were, there was um, a lot of push by civil society organizations to show what happens to black Zimbabweans who come into South Africa, and there is xenophobia from South Africans onto that. It was used as a tool to uh, spread awareness. I did a film in Canada about Aboriginal Canadian women in Highway 16. That film till today is used by the police, RCMP, for um, uh, awareness in the communities about young girls and used by the community itself to talk about what happens uh, to a community when alcohol and drugs engulf it. So there have been different countries that I worked in on different projects where people have been galvanized to use that. Since Ho Yakin was aired on, tel on the series, um, one of the episodes you didn't see was about a school. Um, there was a movement to fund the school um, that kind of came organically. With uh, the woman that you saw in Peshawar, when this series aired, there were so many people who had not seen their sons. When the film aired, a lot of families were reunited. They didn't know that their drug addict sons were at this clinic. So it's, it's interesting to see in what ways and what levels films have an impact on. I generally find that um, women in Pakistan uh, are invested and are pushing the envelope far more than men are. Um, and I've found that in, when I went out to look for, this, to look for the heroes for Ho Yakin, I was shocked that almost every woman, person that I was coming across that was really doing fantastic work on the ground was a woman. Um, whether it was in Balochistan or whether it was in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa or whether it was in Sindh in the province that I live. I mean, men are doing important work, but it seemed that women were doing bolder work and more groundbreaking work, and they were really pushing the envelope. And I, and I think it's because the women really realize what's at stake. Because if for the women, they are the first line of defense. When something goes wrong, it's them. They're the ones who are affected, and they are very invested in that. The other thing that I've noticed is that because women generally tend to not be the main breadwinners of the family, they're able to devote their time to social issues and to working on projects that, that create change. And that is really, really important to factor in, especially in the cities. Um, some of the women that I found their husbands were doing were, were businessmen and the, the, the wives were able to work on some of these things. Um, but if you ask me, Personally, I do think it's the women of Pakistan who will define the next generation, who will push the envelope, who, who speak out the loudest when things happen, and who are more committed to change than the men are. I know there are a number of Pakistani men who will not agree with me, but that's okay.
I think that mindset belongs in the 1400th century because um, you just because you don't talk about an issue that doesn't mean that that issue doesn't exist and I don't think I, I have a big problem with this uh, dialogue about image uh, you are who you are and um, if you're good you're good if you're bad you're bad you can't hide the problems and the issues and the more you talk about the problems and issues the more you initiate dialogue about them the more change will come if you don't talk about the issues it's like sweeping dust under a carpet it's there it'll accumulate and it'll become worse um, I think that we as human beings around the world need to have the difficult conversations and I think it's very naive to think that just because we don't talk about those issues that somehow the world doesn't know about them I think, that, um, I think that every society needs to find its own path and needs to find its own calling. And I think that there are things that we can learn from the West, and we should, and there are things that we can learn from the East, and we should. Um, I think that as a, as a country, we need to start defining what our immediate five goals are, uh, what we need to fix, and we need to concentrate on that because time is running out. And I think that it, to me personally, it doesn't matter whether we borrow from the East or the West as long as it works for Pakistan. You have quite right the mentality in Pakistan is that anything that's Western is wrong and that has to change. Um, I'm shocked to see that there are educated people that come from Pakistan that have, that, that continuously harp on about Pakistan's image. We must stop talking about Pakistan's image and actually start fixing the things on the ground. If we gave so much time to talking about our image and less time to fixing the problems, I think there's something very wrong with the way we think. Um, personally, I think there's a long and hard road that we have to travel on. I don't even think that we've hit rock bottom yet. Things will get much, much worse before they get better. But I think there's a realization in Pakistan now, slowly it's dawning on them that if we don't do something, that we will become a country that completely falls apart and its social fabric of society will completely get ripped. At least that realization has slowly started to dawn on the people of the country. So um, with this particular film, Fatma is a, a woman who de desperately needs help. She needs, if there are people interested in helping her write legislation that she wants to change in Pakistan, that she wants to raise money for some of the families, she wants to provide counseling to the families. Uh, there's, there's a number of things that people can do, individuals can do to bring their talents to partner with someone like her. I think that you can solve issues. There are already people who are working on issues. Instead of replicating that, you just partner with them. Um, and bring your own resources to them. And I think that you know, if anybody is interested in, in you know, partnering or, provide, or donating their time or their efforts or brainstorming ways on how they can help any of the people that are featured in this series, um, I can completely put you in touch with them. See, sir, yeah, yeah. you're very confused because here the mindset is that we need to somehow project Pakistan's image in a positive light. You cannot present a country's image in a positive light when you yourself don't know what you'd like to project. You need to talk about the issues and you need to talk about the people who are working on those issues. These films do that. You, we, as a nation, you can't be Pakistan's PR agent when there's, no, there's very little good going on in the country. You need to talk about the good and the bad because nobody will watch a film that's a travelogue about beautiful places in Pakistan and make that as that belongs on National Geographic. But when you talk about the issues, the only way to do that is to talk about the people who are solving the issues. I often go into places like this and Pakistani Americans tell me, we need to project Pakistan in a positive light. And when I ask them how they'd like to do that, they don't have an answer for me. We never fix the country if we are so focused on its image. We re really need to, in this country as well, talk about the good. One of the reasons that I'm on the tour, talking about bringing these stories here is make people realize that Pakistanis are invested in their own country to affect change. And th that, is, that is an important conversation to have because we often think about Pakistan as a country where Pakistanis somehow absolve themselves from all their responsibilities of the country. It's stories like Fatma's and there are five other stories like hers that show you that everyday Pakistanis are risking their own lives to better their own communities. That to me is presenting Pakistan in a positive light. Apart from forming a, a lobby in the United States and, and lobbying Congress and lobbying uh, the State Department to um, 
follow certain policies, not blindly give aid money to Pakistan. Uh, look at the people that the money is going to. Is it going to the government of Pakistan? Is it going to the military? Or is it going to the people of Pakistan? Those are questions that Pakistani Americans can, as a lobby, ask of uh, Congress because they pay taxes over here. Um, ask your representative. Um, apart from giving money in Pakistan, unfortunately, unless you're willing to send your children there for internships, there's very little that Pakistani Americans can physically do. Um, I think supporting projects is very, very important. Um, it's because of the support of Pakistani Americans that many of the schools that TCF has built, Your Dil has built, many of the hospitals, many of the projects that are run in Pakistan are really, really important for them to be sustained. And that can only happen when money flows from here there. I look at, I look at uh, Pakistani Americans or the diaspora as, as a human being has two arms. If one arm is in Pakistan, the other one can help um, in, not in the same way because those people are invested in Pakistan physically, but help monetarily and help with, with material support, connecting them to organizations over here, or people over here who can help make a difference. Every country that I've been to has a different set of uh, problems. I did a film in Saudi Arabia where we were, uh, you know, there were six times where we were almost arrested. Our tapes were confiscated. The religious police stopped us a number of times. That was probably one of the most difficult countries I've ever filmed in. Syria, um, we were followed all the time. Uh, we had to change two, three cars a day. Um, the intelligence agencies would come into our hotel room, go through our tapes at night. Um, every country has its own unique set of issues that come with it. I have to say that in Pakistan, I've been very fortunate. Um, I've had certain roadblocks. I've had certain times where I've been brought in for questioning or certain things. But by and large, I've always been left on my own to do my work. Uh, so one of the best things that came out of this, this series was that so many people um, heard about these schools and uh, these institutions and these people that they came to them directly and offered them material support, offered them volunteer, became volunteers. Um, as I was saying in, in the Peshawar episode, families were reunited. The doctor got uh, more doctors who came to volunteer. So lots of things have happened. Granted, they haven't happened at the level that I would have hoped that it would have happened. And the thing that we really want to do is we, we've put all these films on the internet. Too bad YouTube has been blocked in Pakistan right now. But when it gets unblocked, uh, the idea is that they would have a second life on the, on the internet. And you, the narration in the series that you watched is in English, but in the Pakistani series, it's all in Urdu, obviously. And um, we're also planning to dub it in regional languages, uh, hopefully, and, and put it out there so it goes into the regional channels as well. And um, I think the most important thing is that people don't realize that they're doing important work until it's documented, and then it's, they watch it. So when they, these people, when they watch their, themselves on screen, they realize the enormous power they have. And almost all of them started crying when they watched their film because they didn't realize that they were doing this important work because nobody had ever shed a, a light on them. And, and to me, that is really important because it makes them stronger and more determined to do the work that they do. And it inspires others to follow in their footsteps because we lack role models in Pakistan and it's only by, by putting pe ordinary people on this uh, pedestal, I feel that it will inspire others to follow in their footsteps. If you're a poor, um, uneducated woman who's not empowered, anywhere in the world that you live, you will have issues. Um, you know, if, especially if you live in a society that's got conflict. But if you live in a large city, you're educated, empowered, you go to work, you'll be probably, Karachi is like Johannesburg, it's like living in Rio. It's got the same kind of violence levels. Well, I, I would say that change does not happen overnight. And um, you always have to invest in change. Um, and there's always a price to pay, play, uh, uh, pay for change. And I, and I think that there are many people like me who are committed to change in Pakistan, who are working to push the boundaries and the envelopes. And we have to put ourselves on the front lines. And if we don't, there won't be a better tomorrow coming from, for our daughters. And we can't risk that.
uh, I will stop making documentaries in a couple of years. Um, I am very, very interested in going into um, education in Pakistan. I've been working on educational projects. I'm very keen on rehauling the curriculum uh, that is taught in government schools. I've launched a pilot project that's been going on for the last three years that works with 10,000 students that opens up their minds to a different world than what is taught to them in schools, and I'd like to take that a step further and maybe one day become the education minister in Pakistan. I'm very keen on, on getting into that. <laughs> it, the film was out. Uh, it came out in 2004 in the US on Discovery. It was called Women of the Holy Kingdom. And I went uh, undercover in Saudi Arabia to document the nascent women's movement. Um, and so I profiled what women in, in, in the kingdom were doing to bring about change on every level, um, the uneducated, the educated women, and what their problems were. Um, I think the highlight of that film was when the film came out, I got a call from, from uh, uh, the Saudi ambassador to the UK. His office called me to say that we, wa we watch the film and we think it's fair. Um, and and that, that's a, that was a compliment because it was a tough film. Uh, it was a tough film. Um, but, but I also, I think, I think, uh, I think the, the very fact that I, I, it was the women who were talking about what they wanted, and there was no Western element, there was nobody from outside saying what the Saudis should get or what they shouldn't get, but it was the Saudi women themselves. I think that really uh, kind of helped, um, you know. I went, let's just say I got another visa to go back. So, yeah. Thank you so much.